we've already hinted at the ways in which we can gain some structural insights from resonant structures. For example, if we find an atom in one resonant structure with a positive charge, and that same atom in a different resonant structure has a neutral charge, what we can say about the true structure of the corresponding molecule is that there's a partial positive charge on the X atom. Likewise, if we see a negative formal charge on an atom in one resonant structure and a neutral formal charge on that atom in another resonant structure, we can conclude that there is a partial negative charge on that atom. And finally, it's also worth pointing out that we can draw conclusions about bond orders from resonant structures. For example, if a pair of atoms has a double bond between them in one resonant structure, but only a single bond between them in another resonance structure, where I'm ignoring formal charges for the time being, what we can say about the true structure is that there is a partial double bond between X and Y such that the bond order for the linkage connecting X and Y is somewhere between 1 and 2, and we represent that using a partial double bond symbol like this in the resonance hybrid. We're going to deepen these ideas in the remainder of this video, focusing on geometry and reactivity. Resonance forces us to go beyond the simple VSEPR model of molecular geometry. For example, in the molecule shown here, we would predict, based on the number of electron pair domains around this nitrogen atom, that it has sp3 hybridization and that its electron group arrangement is tetrahedral, so that its geometry is trigonal pyramidal. However, the quantum mechanically optimized structure for this molecule reveals something interesting. The nitrogen is actually trigonal planar. Notice the 120 degree bond angle and the planarity of the three atoms surrounding nitrogen. This implies that the hybridization at this nitrogen atom is actually sp2, and that its geometry is not trigonal pyramidal, but is actually trigonal planar. The reason for this difference is that resonance is based on orbital overlap, and resonance active groups and molecules have geometric arrangements that reflect the optimal overlap of orbitals. We'll see what this means in a second, but for the time being, I just want to draw a resonance structure of this molecule that's going to help us understand why the geometry of nitrogen is trigonal planar rather than tetrahedral. We can draw a resonance structure using n to pi star electron flow, starting from the nitrogen as an electron source and using the oxygen atom as an electron sink. Notice in the resulting resonance structure that this nitrogen now has three electron pair domains, and so based on this resonance structure alone, we would predict that the hybridization of nitrogen is sp2, and that its geometry is trigonal planar. Why is this the resonance structure that dictates the geometry rather than the one above? Well, it has a lot to do with the fact that we created a bond in this resonance structure that is not present in the resonance structure above. That bond implies orbital overlap, and the best way for the orbitals to overlap, as we'll see here in just a second, is for the nitrogen to have sp2 hybridization and be trigonal planar. If we look now at the molecular orbitals associated with this structure, we can see why we need sp2 hybridization at the nitrogen atom. sp2 hybridization means that there is a p orbital remaining on this nitrogen atom that's unhybridized, and it's the resonance active lone pair that resides in this p orbital. In order for the lone pair to serve as an electron source, it needs to overlap with an orbital on the adjacent carbon atom in a pi-type fashion. That's why we see a new pi bond in the resonance structure between the carbon and nitrogen atoms. The pi star orbital for the carbon-oxygen bond, which I'm not going to draw to scale, but this will get the point across, looks something like this. And because p orbitals are involved in this pi orbital between carbon and oxygen, we really need the lone pair in a p orbital to optimize the overlap between the adjacent lobes here and here, and here and here. The punchline is that because this lone pair is really engaged of a bond of sorts with the carbon next door, the nitrogen adopts sp2 hybridization. This hybridization allows this pair of electrons to occupy an unhybridized atomic 2p orbital. The useful practical piece of information to conclude from this is that lone pairs engaged in resonance do not count toward the EPD count for the purpose of predicting geometry. This is because they occupy unhybridized atomic 2p orbitals. So in determining hybridization and geometry, etc., we don't consider lone pairs engaged in resonance. Another way to think about this when evaluating geometry and hybridization is to look at the resonance structure in which any resonance active lone pairs are engaged in pi bonds. The hybridization you would predict from that resonance structure alone is the hybridization of the atom in reality. 
Resonance structures that contain formal charges can reveal hidden electron sources and sinks in molecules where we wouldn't notice them in the absence of the resonance structure. For example, enol ethers, which include an oxygen attached to a carbon-carbon double bond, are good electron sources at carbon. And we can see this by drawing a resonance structure using n to pi star electron flow. In the resonance structure that results from this flow, we notice a negative formal charge and a lone pair on carbon, indicating that this carbon is likely a good electron source, certainly as compared to a plain vanilla alkene in which this key oxygen atom is missing. Carbonyl groups, which feature the carbon-oxygen double bond, are electron sinks at carbon. And we can see this by simply pushing the pi bond onto oxygen, the more electronegative atom in the double bond. We haven't talked too much about this individual bond type of electron flow in drawing resonance structures, but you'll see it often for double and triple bonds, since it's always okay to push a double or triple bond onto one or the other of the atoms involved in the bond. When we do that in the carbonyl case, the resulting resonance structure contains a carbon atom with a formal positive charge, indicating the presence of a good electron sink. Notice that without drawing these two resonance structures, we wouldn't really be able to tell from the neutral resonance forms alone where the electron sources and sinks were. But the resonance structures allow us to draw useful conclusions, such as the carbon in a carbonyl group contains a partial positive charge, or the distal carbon, in other words, the one farther away from the oxygen atom in an enol ether, likely has a partial negative charge. Unless you think this only works well for neutral molecules, it also works well to reveal hidden points of reactivity in ions as well. For example, the structure I'm drawing here is called the pyridinium ion, and it looks, based on this resonance structure, like the nitrogen is a good electron sink because of its positive charge. That's certainly true, but there are other points of reactivity within this structure that we can see by drawing resonance structures. If, for example, we do pi to pi star electron flow within the ring, we arrive at a resonance structure that has formal positive charge on one of the carbon atoms within the ring, revealing that nitrogen is not the only electron sink in this molecule, and that carbon, too, can serve as an electron sink.